Welcome to our favorite One Tough podcast. We're uh, about to embark here uh, right before, uh, what's it, Labor Day? Labor Day weekend. Labor Day weekend. I'm joined here, like always, with my producer, Carlo. Hi, Carlo. Uh, Today, we're pleased to have uh, a very good friend. He's part of my family, Greg Olson, one of the most interesting people I've ever met in my life. And I've met them all, but Greg is something special. One thing about Greg is that his success is... Endless, but yet he's such a beautiful person inside. I think that makes his personality such a uh, remarkable. Because if I was Greg Olson and I had the value of Greg Olson, maybe I'd be a little different. Greg, you're a, <laughs> you're a, you're a warm, beautiful, family loving guy with your grandchildren and your daughters and all that. And welcome to our uh, podcast. Thank you, Bo. Uh, yeah. I, I value you as a friend as well. Yeah. And, uh, you, I mean, I'll just go over from 50,000 feet. Greg is a electrical physicist. You ever hear that, Carlo? No. That's something like better than an electrical engineer. You know what I mean? Physicist, higher, and all that. And Greg is unique in the fact that he's one of 500 people that has ever gone into space. That's another area that it, that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about. But let's talk about you growing up, Greg. Yeah. Where did you grow up first off? Okay, uh, I was born in Brooklyn, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. But we moved to uh, northern New Jersey, Ridgefield Park, and that's kind of where I grew up. Graduated Ridgefield Park High School. Um, I was the youngest kid in my class. And the way I... <coughs> got along with kids was I figured some of these guys are two years older than me, so I'm not going to out-tough them. But what I did was I did more outrageous things than they could do. You know, if they stole a loaf of bread, I stole a case of soda. <laughs> you know, and on and on like that. I would do the more outrageous things. I mean, we threw snowballs at teachers. <laughs> I, I got suspended from school twice. Once on the night of the prom, and my girlfriend's crying, and I spent $30 on this dress. How could you do this to me? <laughs> uh, I was uh, convicted of juvenile delinquency, if you remember that term. Sure. 1961, Bergen County Court. Uh, I flunked trigonometry in my senior year. Yeah, that's why I want to go into your grades, because you were so, mm-hmm. you're such a small guy. To me, if I had a question, I asked Greg Olson. Now, you remind me of my brother, Alan, God rest his soul. He was uh, well-read like you are. And uh, how about your grades in school? I mean, doing all this juvenile delinquency yeah. shit, it, uh, it how was your grades? Help. It doesn't matter how smart you are. You know, in the sciences, math, you've, you've got to uh, study it. You can't just wing it the way you can in grade school. And it caught up with me in high school. I mean, I drifted free through uh, grade school. I was a character then, too, but I was o- always able to get Bs and As. When I hit my junior year in high school, it all kind of caught up with me. And uh, my guidance counselor told me, Olson, you're not college material. <laughs> Why don't you join the Army? <laughs> and this was 1962, pre-Vietnam, yeah. when you join the Army and see the world. Yeah. So I was actually going to do it. I went to the recruiter. I took the exam, signed up. Where do you want to go? And I was only 17 at the time. So the recruiter said, you know, you need your parents' signature. So I went back to my father and said, hey, Dad, would you sign it? My dad and I never got along. Uh, He was my way or the highway type. Tough guy. He was an electrician, local three electrician, all his life. Uh, And he looked up at me and said, you know, Greg, it's getting hard to get into the union and they may require six months of college. He says, why don't you try it, and if you don't like it, I'll sign the form. So in other words, he wanted you to go into the apprenticeship of Local 3? No, he wanted me to go to college instead of the apprenticeship Uh program. And I was so dumbfounded. I mean, it was such a reasonable thing to say. I was like, blah, 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 okay. Now, here's what should have happened. You stupid ass, why do you want to do something like that, you idiot? We get into an argument, and I would have forged his signature. That's what should have happened. And yet, you know, I've had all through life these, you know, issues of grace. I say, you know, something happens to you you don't deserve, and it just happens. And that was one of them. Well, you know, and, and, and Carla, you don't know about him as far as supporting with the Navy SEALs and all the military 
uh, uh, you know, Greg is just a major supporter of all our vet veterans and all that, and that's one of his sweet spots in life now that he's able to give a lot back, and that was one of the things. I think also, Greg, in my thing, I was at Floyd Bennett Field. I was going into the Marine Corps when I was uh, – I graduated at 17 years of age, and Vietnam was – it was mm -hmm. full swing back there in 1968, and I wanted to do that. I had taken the cop test. I was working as an iron worker on the World Trade Center. Everything was happening so fast, and then all of a sudden, the lottery came up, and mm -hmm. I, my name was in the lottery, and I, I lucked out, probably lucked out my life because, like anything, even when I became a, a cop and a detective, yes. I was always the first one through. To, I would call mm -hmm. it in military the point guy. So if you were a point guy in Vietnam, you didn't last that long because yeah. you were the first one with your big face out there so the goo could pop your head off. And, uh, you know, that that's, you know, I, life is strange how yeah. it goes in different ways. And there's a reason why I'm still sitting here, you're still sitting, Carl's still sitting. I, I also had a high number on the uh, lottery. So that's yeah. what happened. Oh, they me. had the lottery? I was, them. yeah, I was drafted and, you know, Set to go. I didn't want to, but yeah. I wasn't going to run away either. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was yeah. one void that I say to this day of my whole life. You say one thing that you that you felt as though you missed out in life was to go into the military. I think every right. young man yeah. should be able to go into the military. It straightens them out, yeah. respect, courtesy, and, and learns the value of life, whereas if you don't Tell, you know, there's so many kids out there that don't have any clue, especially if their parents have a couple of bucks. They go through life with, Daddy, Mommy, I need some money and all that, and mm -hmm. you don't know how to work hard. But let's go back to you. So now in high school, you, you get out. You didn't go right away to college? Uh, How'd you get actually, into college with your oh, shitty good, bucks? Absolutely. So I go over to Fairleigh Dickinson in Teaneck, New Jersey, uh, and I applied to the engineering school, and I said, you can't go into engineering. You flunk trigonometry. And, you know, so I go home and uh, I say, well, maybe I can take a summer class. Now, you so got a, you graduated high school. I graduated, What yeah, kind of diploma did you get? Uh, we had three then. General. Uh, scientific. Or, general. Uh, sorry, college. College prep. Uh, uh, but I had a 77 average. Uh -huh. So, you know, mediocrity was all over me. <laughs> so um, there was a summer class in trigonometry at Fairleigh. And I go to the registrar, if you remember in those days, you stood online, and I get up in the end, and I say, I want to uh, register for trigonometry. This registrar smirked at me and said, you know, it's, it started last week, it's closed, sorry. And I went, ah, what am I going <laughs> to do now? You know, the class was on at that very moment, and I went down, and I waited outside the class. And when it was over, I went up to the uh, instructor and pleaded my case. I said, please, I need this to start engineering. I'll and catch it, up to whatever yeah. I missed. Oh, I said, look, I've had this. I understand it. And he said, I'm not supposed to do this. All right, take this to the registrar. Wow. I went it. I got an that A in the class. That could have been a move that changed your life 100%, direction. 100%, yeah. And I met a girl in the trig class who didn't know anything, so <laughs> I scored two victories there. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a second. So now you go to Fairleigh Dickinson. What, mm -hmm. what kind of a degree do you end up getting? Um, my first degree was in physics, bachelor's in physics. And then I, I was actually studying for two at the same time, uh, physics and electrical engineering. So I stayed on for my master's. And I wound up with degrees in, uh, I got a master's in physics and a bachelor's in electrical engineering. Wow. And then I went on to University of Virginia, where my grandson Justin just yeah. started. Uh, you know, it's a great school there. The, absolutely. The, the, the really, yeah. He's really excited. His grandson that was up in our office, remember he did the uh, sure, Wolf yeah. of Wall Street? <laughs> yeah. what, a, what a kid he is. And his, his excitement is that he was able to get into the, his alma mater, which is oh. wonderful, wonderful. What, what a, a legacy, I'm yeah, telling Yeah, yeah, so. but hold on a second. You got more degrees than a, than a thermometer here, Greg. <laughs> hold on a second now. I like that line. So when you get to, uh, yeah. so you do Fairleigh Dickinson now, uh -huh. do you start working? Working? Do you start working on things? Do you have like little little side things that you start developing oh, electricity well, or some shit? Come well, on. During my uh, four years at uh, undergraduate, Fairleigh <coughs> Dickinson, I was uh, what they called a summer helper in Local 3, IBEW. I was an electrician's helper. And I lugged a lot of pipe. So you were loaded. making money uh, laboring with that? Yeah, with basically the laboring. The thing is, since I knew uh, electronics, 
I actually was useful because when they had uh, rectifiers and things like that, the old time guys didn't understand them. So, you know, I could shine a little bit. So you were learning all these aspects of electrical engineering while you were going to college because you were actually yeah. doing it in, in real with Local 3. Yes. Yep. So what made you, like, break away from just putting a friggin' light switch into the wall and now going into the next level? You know, I, I just kept going. I really didn't know what to do. I didn't have, I'm not a guy that sets goals and plans and so forth. Yeah, but you had to have a real no, analytic I, mind, Greg. I mean, eventually you go on to develop patents. I know yeah. all about you, Greg. Right. You are, you eventually go on to develop patents on different things. How did this, yeah. you know, from, from being an electrician, putting a plug in a wall, now all of a sudden you're starting to invent things. Not, not an easy thing to do, by the way, if it's done correctly. Let me point that out. Um, uh, what happened with me is I, I just sort of kept rolling because, I, I, like I said, I was the youngest guy in all my classes, didn't know what to do, so I figured, oh, let me stay in school. But, I, but the point is where I'm going is that all these things that you eventually, you know, like Sarnoff Labs, mm -hmm. all, the, all the, you know, that will come out in a little bit, but these are places where they invented the dish TV, uh, color, color TV. TV. So what made you go into that area where all of a sudden you started to look at things that needed a patent to develop? How many patents have you actually developed, <sighs> Greg? Twelve. Twelve patents that you got, you're accredited to twelve yes. patents. Yes, now most of those are with other people, two or three well, other people. But you're still on with, involved yes. with twelve mm -hmm. patents that were issued yep. to you, and with those patents, people have to utilize your patent stuff, and you get revenue out of that, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, I'll tell you, and anyone that has a lot of patents would agree with me, I think. A lot of my patents are just minor uh, advancements over existing art, Okay. The best idea I ever had was something where a method of growing crystals, and I was at RCA Laboratories. And for some reason, we couldn't get that patent. And we tried and tried, and it kept getting rejected. And I remember going home, and I was really disappointed. Three years later, when I started my first company, Epitax, if they, RCA had that patent, they could have put me right out of business. So, so they wouldn't they wouldn't develop that patent, but you couldn't yeah. give it to RCA. But now you now you're in another company. Now you can develop it. Yeah. So see the old story. Sometimes the what worst was that? Things, what did that have to do with Greg? That patent, you know, uh, fifty thousand feet. What a way done? of uh, depositing gas onto uh, uh, crystals. Well, you got to change. You make I don't know PNN gas. The only gas I have is if I eat beans. Right. <laughs> My point is, what does yeah. that mean? The gas onto the crystals. Well. Um, to make it very simple, a transistor is made of positive and negative materials. All right? How do you make those positive and negative materials? You do it by adding certain chemicals. Certain chemicals are positive, certain are negative. I don't want to get too technical here, but uh, I developed a method of depositing, of using gases to make areas positive and negative. On an actual crystal? Yes, on a crystal. Now, instead You're of- You're talking about a crystal, a rock. Uh, well, a friggin rock. Th these are dishes, um, materials like silicon or gallium arsenide that are used. They, they come, they look like a salami, and they're cut with a diamond saw and, and wow. polished into wafers. And, wow. that's and this what is we use. Condu conductivity of electrical. You change the conductivity, yeah. Wow. And that's how you make either a transistor or a laser. Wow! 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 So, so now you're. Uh, so now you've graduated uh, Virginia, mm -hmm. and now you, what was your first job that you actually got out upon graduation? Uh, well, actually, I did a postdoctoral position in South Africa for a year and a half. I was uh, in their physics department, assisting other graduate students and doing my own research. And that was also a life-changing experience, because when I got my PhD in 1971, <laughs> there was an oversupply of scientists, all right? Vietnam was winding down at that time, and we'd been to the moon. What was your PhD four times, in? Material science, okay. which is kind of like a collection of uh, metallurgy, uh, electronics, and physics. So I went to South Africa, 
uh, for a year and a half. And when I came back, I got a job at RCA Laboratories. In Jersey? Uh, yes, in Princeton, New Jersey. Now, anyone uh, under 50 years old might not recognize the, the name RCA. Oh, I do. Yeah, well, it, it was RCA. Was, was there like a dog GE? or something? Sure, a Nipper. A dog with that yeah. thing with the thing with, with the, the ear? Uh, phone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was a big, you know, in the 60s, they were a leader in color television. And unfortunately... Due to bad leadership, uh, the company disappeared. Well, like GE. I mean, who would think GE would go into the toilet bowl? Yeah. General Electric, RCA. Yeah. Who would ever hope? Huh? Yeah. Lehman right. Brothers. I mean, all these companies that we all grew up with, who would think that they would but, you know, be, be I mismanaged? Got, I got great training. That was an apprenticeship for me because I learned all about how to make lasers and photo detectors and how you use them in fiber optics. So, you know, for 11 years... I got that knowledge, and just one day I said, you know what, I want to start a business doing this. I think I could do it better and faster and cheaper than they can. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the first company, yep. what was that called? Epitax. Epitaxy is the technique of uh, growing these crystals that I was describing So now earlier. that first company, so then you get patents on that. Yeah. And then when do you sell that company? Uh, I sold, we started it in 1984, and we sold it in 1990. Uh, to a Japanese company, Nippon Sheet Glass. Mm -hmm. And if you remember 1990, that's when uh, the Japanese bought Rockefeller Center. Yep. They bought Pebble Beach Golf Course. Right. And we thought they were going to own the world. Own right? the world. It didn't yep. quite happen. Mm -hmm. Fast forward 35 years and substitute China for Japan. Everyone's saying, oh, Japan's going to rule the yep. world. I, 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 I'm not counting the U.S. out at all. Uh, Good. So. so now you sell, then you end up selling that company. Where do you go after that? Um, I went right and sold. You made my a couple of potatoes on that. Yeah, we sold the company for uh, $12 million. And I mean, I, you know, I had a partner, Vladimir Ban, and I think we only got about 13% of that. But it was the richest, relatively, it was the richest time of my life because I went from being you were, you were a nobody a financially, yeah. So, and then you just kept rolling it. So yeah. next company. I started my second company called Sensors Unlimited, which made uh, near-infrared cameras. They see in the dark, like uh, for night vision, yep. for the military, and there are other commercial uses for it. So uh, I took all my winnings from my first company and went into debt. I mean, I, I was worth zero for about five years. And I'll tell you, Bo, I didn't lose one wink of sleep. Yeah, because you knew you could do it, and you were coming back. I wanted to do it. No, and I no, no in cloud it. of depression came no. over you. Just as not it's about a, money. No. Wow, because you knew what you had. You knew the skills that you had, and no matter what happens, I'm going to come back stronger. Yeah, if you know, I was never the best at anything. I was never the best student. Never the best athlete. Uh, but somehow in business, and I, I don't fully understand why or how, but I'm able to. Um, do reasonably well in it. I mean, I've had my losses. Now I do investments, and but when I was in business, I was just determined. And you know, it's that uh, do whatever you have to do to get it done and not quit. It's twenty four seven, three sixty five. Well, I, yeah. I, I say that you know, even with my own kids and my people who work for me. You know, hard work equals success. It doesn't. Everyone life they think life is the lottery. Oh, I'm going to invent this. I'm going to no, do that. I'm going to become so rich. No, it's that that the tenuous. Hard work, yeah. hard work, getting up early, going, doing it again and again, and bring it up yeah. there. So from that company, you sell that company then? Yes. Now, we sold that for uh, stock in the year 2000, if you remember, in the, the telecom boom. Mm -hmm. uh, and the stock at that time was worth $600 million. Wow. Now, we weren't paid in cash. We were paid... 20 in stock, 20 million shares of Finisar stock. And what, what was the stock? It was worth $30 at that time of sale. So you do the math and, you know, it comes to $600. And the funny thing is at that time, everybody believed stock was worth more than cash, mm. you know, because it kept the yeah, stock the markets going yeah. up. So, uh, you know, when the it came raised... The dot-com boom, this was during. Yeah, 100%. I would yeah. offer somebody... a. 10% raise, and I said, no, 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 I don't want to raise. I want Give to me more stock well, options. Just hold that right there, because I remember being at Rayo's up there with Nikki at the bar. 
I, and at that time I had retired, and the guy would come up with, with tips. I'd call my broker. And I was doing yeah. pretty good. Though. I was making a lot of money. Uh, buy me two hundred thousand dollars a share. It's a, sh- a mm-hmm. dollar a share. My broker would say, "Bo, there's no float." I said, "Look, <laughs> you buy the shit. I'm. I'll tell you. I pay for it." So I spent probably five million dollars on dot com bullshit because mm-hmm. in my mind I just thought maybe I would step on something like you got. And the next thing it would become, no, Uh all losers. I lost about at least five million bucks on just shooting there, and there was no float. And half, 90, 95% of the companies went down the drain. So now yours didn't go down the drain, obviously. No, but the dot com bust happened about a year and a half later. And that $30 per share was now worth 50 cents a share. So we bought the company back for $6 million. And you ended say, up buying the company. We back. did for six million in cash, and people say, "Oh, you know what a wheeler dealer you are." And I said, "No, if you do the math at fifty cents a share, you know it's not worth that much anymore." So, you know, we were actually it was a good deal for everybody. Finisar got some cash. We got our company back. So, what did you end and, up flipping that for? Uh, well, we then focused on military imaging. And we wound up selling that in the year 2005 for $60 million, <laughs> all cash, to Goodrich Corporation. Great. And, and that was my last startup. That was your last startup. Then where did you go after that, after 05? Um, after that, well, I had my space thing that we'll, I guess, talk about. Yeah. And then We'll now, stay with the business, then we're going to go into, we're sure. gonna go into that. Uh, so, so now, what's your next one after 05, in the business realm? Oh, that was it. Uh, <laughs> after that, I switched to venture capital where I was the investor. And okay, so you had a pile of money then, you said, well, look at it. I'm going to look at different companies. One company I know about, because uh, I've made a few dollars on that company, was a, a thing called Power Survey. Yeah, Power Survey. Tom Catanese. And if you want to meet an entrepreneur as entrepreneur, a driven guy. Young I, guy. He, oh. Unbelievable. Yeah. Has a mind like, it's, it's unbelievable. Tom yeah. is so analytic, yeah. and what, you, you look at him, He's prematurely gray, handsome-looking son of a gun, mm-hmm. and he's just so smart, so driven. Quick, so you hook up with minded. Tom. Go ahead. Yeah. Does uh, he come to I, you with the idea? No. I, I, it's a long story. What, what about Sarnos? We haven't talked about that. Oh, all right. <laughs> if, we, if we have like three minutes, I'll tell you yeah, the story please. how I discovered Power Survey. Um, I met the, uh, the former CEO of Sarnoff was Jim Carnes. He had retired the next CEO didn't work out. So they said, Jim, would you come back and be temporary CEO? And what's that line from uh, The Godfather? When Just when I thought I was out. They pulled me back yeah. in. <laughs> That's what happened to Jim Corn. So we said, listen, Greg, why don't you come in? I was playing golf with him. Come in to Sarnoff and look around and see if you're interested in any now, of these Now, give companies. an overview of what Sarnoff is. Sarnoff's a research lab. They have all kinds of scientists, and I mean, now it's just a former shell the of itself. development of dish, yeah. the dish uh, network, microwaves, TV, TV so lasers. So this is a real technology company, yeah. so go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, I naturally, I went through a lot of technological presentations, view graphs, curves. So you became the head I'm, of it then, Greg? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm in just looking at companies okay. at Corn's request. So in other words, at Sarnoff, so, they had all these different companies yeah. that were developing shit there. And the, you come in as a venture capitals to correct. look at, ooh, let me see. Yes. Oh, those, those watermelons look ripe. I'm going to exactly. buy some watermelons. Go ahead. Yeah. So the last one, I was ready to walk out. I was saturated with technology. And up steps Tom Catanese. He says, we have this business looking for stray voltages in streets. Um, We have ongoing business. We've got money in the bank. And I said, this one's for me. So (laughs) up here, and when Carnes asked me, what do you think, Greg? I felt like I was playing stud poker with four aces face down. Uh And I said, you know, my heart is racing. I said, well, Jim, give me a... I really don't know. (laughs) Give me me a couple hours to think this over. But you knew where you were going. Oh, yeah. So I I drove around in my car, and I'm looking at my watch saying, I think there's enough time. And then I said, Jim, I'm really interested in that uh, stray voltage company. And that was the roots of Power Survey. And I did two things with Tom Catanese. Number one, I was smart enough to invest in him. And secondly, I was smart enough to stay the hell out of his way and just let him be himself. And the result is what well, you I, see. I've, got, I've gotten that from Tom, and I love Tom too. And matter of fact, he, he reiterated that to me many times. You let him just do what he wanted. You never called but, up and said, eh, 
And then it, it became it, what it is, uh, Carlo, is it's, it's every old city has the wires underneath the grounds. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the wires get frayed, uh, the, the coating around them, they touch metal, yeah. and they conduct the electrical... Uh, uh, About f 15 years ago, a woman was killed in the East Village. I remember Jody that. Jody Lane. Yeah. Uh, it was a real tragedy, and that's kind of what gave impetus to this business. And this is all over the country, really, and the, the potential of power survey to this day is oh. enormous because it's not going away. And if anything, the yeah. wires are getting older. Yeah. And they, the responsibility of the power companies are the liability, hey, this is your stuff you oversee, and you're responsible for, hence, power survey. And I have to be very open about it. We do work for power survey. We have the technicians and the flaggers, and it's a very, very fine company and probably one of the best clients I've ever had you guys pay every week, and I love you for that. <laughs> so, Craig, yeah. um, you know, when you're talking about investing in mm -hmm. companies, it's, from what you just described, it seems like you don't just invest in the technology, you also invest in the person. Oh, I only invest in the person. Okay. The technology is uh, superficial. Um, I've invested in uh, uh, educational software, um, some kind of uh, thing in Canada, the way they look at compliance, and I have no idea what they do. But I invested in them once, and they did well. So I said, again, if they're doing it, I'm investing. Uh, the technology is superfluous. And people come to me thinking, oh, Greg, you're a technologist. Uh, I'm probably less likely to invest in technology, especially the ones I understand, because yeah, I know the pitfalls. And then a person, you, do you know Greg has a ranch in Montana? Greg has a winery in Cape Town, is it? Outside of Cape Town in, in the South city Africa. Of Parle. Some delicious wine, also wines. We have all different white wines. We have the, what's that called? That one I like uh, uh, the name. It's a funny name. Chenin Blanc? No, the other one. Pinotage. Pinotage, yeah. That's... yeah. Yeah, he has, a, he has a winery, and, and every uh, winter, around February, he'll disappear for about a month yep. when he goes to pick the grapes. That's harvest time. It's yeah. the summertime. It's the opposite season, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, what made you get into that wine? Well, um, again, long story, but I did a postdoc in South Africa in 1971, 1972. I lived there during apartheid, and I never thought what would happen happen. I thought it would explode like a powder keg, and I'm as surprised and pleased as anyone else that you know they made the transition. But um, so that's what got me aware of the country, and I would be invited back about every three or five years to give talks and lectures. And uh, after we sold Sensors Unlimited, uh, I, I just saw this one winery, and I fell in love with it instantly. Which, which, which company was that? Sensors. Sensors Unlimited. We sold it in 2000. And I bought the winery in 2002. It's spectacularly beautiful. Con countryside. And then yeah. Montana is Montana. You go, he goes off well, the grid. No well, words, uh, cell phones, well, that's, no uh, worky. Uh, I'm, uh, I like American history, and I'm, uh, I have been very interested in uh, General Custer. Yeah. So the battlefield, uh, Little Bighorn Battlefield, is in Montana. And that's what got me out there. And same thing sort of happened. Uh, I love it out I there. Saw I saw a ranch, it. and boom. Yeah, I love that uh, uh, in uh, Wyoming there, uh, the Cowboy Tower. Jackson Hall. Jackson, I love uh -huh. it. I've been in many, many times taking the kids into Yellowstone. I, I love it out west. I tell everybody, everybody runs to Europe. Hey, go to Alaska. We I took the kids up there. We have some of the most beautiful sites in the world right here in our own hemisphere. You don't have to go to Europe. You could go... Go to Alaska, I tell people, or go out west. I did the rapids of the Grand Canyon many times. The Rockies, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. Now, let's talk about something that, because I always introduce Greg. Greg is, like I said, family. But I always introduce him as my friend Greg, the astronaut. Now, how did you get involved with doing that, Greg? Because to me, that's beyond any. There's five, you're one of 500 that's gone into space. Go ahead. True story. Uh, June 2003, I'm sitting in Starbucks, Princeton, sipping a coffee, and if you're ever looking for me, that's a good place to find me, reading a newspaper, and I come upon a story about how it's possible for civilians to go up in space via the Russian Space Agency, and this was a wow moment. I said, I well, want to do this. You had this. the potatoes at that time. Oh. You had the wealth. Yeah, so. I, I did. So um, you know, I, I called up the company that Space Adventures that did it. Eric Anderson went to University of Virginia like I did. 
His partner, Chris, lived in Rocky Hill, right next to Princeton. So there were a lot of, if you're a salesperson, a lot of clicks that happened. And, um, you know, six months later, I find myself in Russia training. Well, hold on. Eh? You're going a little fast now. Yeah. It was a course factor to it. Oh, yeah. It was $20 million. At that time. At, now I think it's higher. Oh, right? yeah. It's 70, 80 million now. Yeah, I haven't so, checked. But, but 20 million back then was 20 million. It's like 80 million you now. Bet. I mean, listen, uh, everything's quite, relative. But everything's relative. Russians aren't stupid. So now, how old, what's your age at that time? 60 years old. 60 years old, you did, You decide to go through training now. It's not they stuff you into a soil use and shoot you up. There's training oh, involved, yeah. so you had to go to yeah. Russia. Go ahead. Yeah, you have to train for about six months. And while I'm not qualified to fly the vehicle, uh, I am qualified to fly in it. And in order to do that, you have to know a lot of stuff. You have to yeah, know. Yeah, if the two other guys yeah. black out, right. what do you do there? Um, <laughs> you radio the ground. <laughs> um, but no, all the emergency procedures, what do you do in a fire? Toxic gas leak. You know, how do you radio the different parts of the space and station? And then 60 years old, too. I mean, look, I'm 68 years old. You know, I've had six stents, I say it very openly. You know, my health is, I feel great. I still do 80 push-ups. But mm -hmm. as you get older, the health aspects come in. Now, when they were doing the training, yeah. how was that? Uh, it was good. The hardest part for me by far was trying to learn to speak Russian. Uh, for any of the Russian speakers out there, Ya Gavaru Peruski Niochin show. I don't speak Russian very well. Uh, I had an interpreter in my classes, but a typical day was you get up six o'clock, run around the lake, have breakfast, classes nine to four, four to six more physical training, dinner, homework. Up again this morning. A lot of morning. vodka, or not too much. No, vodka? no, not. I mean, on the weekends, some. Um, I, I would say Russians drink about the same as we do. Not Mike uh, the Russian. Uh, you saw him last night. Uh, he look, drinks his vodka straight. Sure, there's, there's always exceptions. But, um, I mean, it's a, at least everybody associated with the space program, I would say, yeah, they'd like beer and wine, but I didn't see any great vodka drinking. Yeah. Uh, other than celebrations. So now your health, did you have any concern? Did they have any health yes. concerns about yeah. you? I've had a collapsed lung, and mm -hmm. it's a spontaneous collapsed lung. It happened by itself. It's a family defect that about five members of my family have had. And they knew this, and it was like the, you know, the red flag hanging out there. So after training for three months in 2004, they did a lung x-ray, and they found this black spot. That's it. You're out. Oh, yeah, they didn't yeah. want to know why, where, just that's it, out. And uh, it turned out the black spot was a harmless. It was a fungus. And so I get a note from my doctor, ready to fly again. The Russians say, yet. Niet, 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 Carlo, means niet. No. <laughs> that was when I yeah. remember Khrushchev, niet, hit his yeah, shoe yeah. back in the United That's, Nations. He brought that shoe in his bag. That was, <laughs> Khrushchev was a very smart guy, uh, very street smart. So they say so, no, they go niet, yeah. and, when, no. and you and, say and yes. I, I, I was devastated. I came back, it was on 4th of July, 2004. Oh, they sent you back to the United States. Yeah, well, I, I can't stay there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm back, and everyone's, Greg, we thought you were going to space. So about 100 times I had to tell the story. Yeah, black spot on the lung, I got disqualified. And, I mean, it was like getting uh, flunking out of school, like getting fired Did from a job. Did you get your $20 million back? Uh, that was, that's a complicated story because the payments were in stages. Uh. And I actually had insurance, Lloyd's of London, uh, insured me, so I was kind of covered that way. That was but smart. I, I didn't want to collect the insurance. I wanted to fly. Mm -hmm. So eight times I reapplied, and they kept saying yet. After yet. that, eight times. Yeah. But like I said, resilience. My, don't give up. Persistence. The ninth time. Uh, now I'm at. I was a patient at the Bora Heart and Lung, and they were the ones. Dr. David Murphy uh, was my doctor. And I actually got him to come over to Moscow with me. He flew to he Moscow. He flew to for Moscow you? with a, a boatload of X-rays and medical uh, things. We go to the medical commission, uh, and they come out and they say, "Olson, we accept lungs." <laughs> wow! Holy shit! Yeah. So and just like that, this now you're was back May on track again. Of 2000. Had there but... been any launches in between there? Oh yeah. yeah oh, so yeah. they were shooting them up. And here's the interesting thing. You know, this third Soyuz has uh, three seats. Typically, seats or you stand? Uh, seats. There's a, a cosmonaut commander, a Russian cosmonaut commander, and a NASA astronaut as flight engineer. 
The third seat they usually sell to someone. Now, it, it, during the Soviet Union, they'd have you know, a Cuban or a Bulgarian Air Force pilot. They'd yeah. train them and go up. This was one of the few times when a Russian did the third seat because they didn't have time to find anybody else new. Ah. So um, there were actually two Soyuz flights after mine. And then I went into training and met my, uh, I trained every day with astronaut Bill MacArthur and uh, cosmonaut uh, Valery Tokarev. And you get very close. Uh, well, hold on. And now, for the listening audience, if you really want to see what the Soyuz looks like, you go on the Intrepid. Greg donated the Soyuz capsule to uh, the Intrepid uh, aircraft carrier. Yeah. And you see the size of this table? Yeah, that's about it's it. It's the size, this little round table is the size of the Soyuz. So you're, you're like, you said it's a seat. I thought you stood. <laughs> uh, not, well, not when not you're weightless, it doesn't matter. But so you And how long are you standing? When, okay, so let's let's go to the day that you get launched. Because so after all this training, yeah. Yeah. when the day finally comes, yep. is it yeah. like mind-blowing? Oh. Yeah, because, you know, people always ask me, weren't you scared? Weren't you scared? I would be scared it, shit, and I'm claustrophobic, so there ain't no freaking way uh, I'm going into that capsule. Right. Here's what I was scared of, that somehow walking out to that launch pad, somebody's going to tap me on the shoulder and say, Lungs you know, your again? heart beat is irregular because uh, we wear a whole uh, chest set up, uh, you know, like, you can't again, go. Yet right. again. So when that rocket, I want to... Uh, I felt the shaking when the rocket was okay, taking Okay, now off. you get on it, but you're yeah. always thinking, and then someone's going to go, and yet, lungs, get back. Sure. Now so, you get into position. You're sitting there like, like us street cosmonauts here. Yeah. We're sitting there, and now you figure, now you're having a countdown. That you're, you're, you're all go. Yeah. So what's the feeling? Oh, excitement. Um, so each time as it gets closer and closer, I'm saying, yes, this is really going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and when that thing shook, I was like, yay. Yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you, I had the lowest heart rate of anybody going wow. up. Really? Oh, wow. Really? Wow. Yeah. How wow. long was the trip to the uh, To get 10 days total. Now, now here, to explain right. the trip, yeah. because a lot of people who are listening don't yeah. understand. Okay. The trip, it takes about 10 minutes to get into orbit. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. We went from zero to 17,000 miles an hour in about nine minutes. And uh, to do that, you accelerate at a rate that puts a force of about three and a half Gs on your body. Now, what that means is, let's say if you weigh 100 pounds on Earth uh, at rest, you're weighing about 350 pounds. And That's like you have to eat the pizza <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I remember it was lifting my arm was hard. Uh, and then after this nine minutes, all of a sudden, it's like when you're on the top of a roller coaster. Yeah. It's feeling like you're free and everything is floating. And that's how we knew we were in orbit. And, and then how long does it take to get to the space uh, two station? Two days. Now, this oh. is the International Space Station yeah. that everyone has a piece of. They put modules and they attach yeah. them. So now it takes three days? How come it takes so freaking no, long? No, it took two days uh, because the uh, guidance systems weren't as good back then as they are now. Now they can do it in maybe two orbits. So, like, they so can get there four hour, to six hours. hours. Uh, yeah, a couple six hours. Six hours you hook up. We wow. had to make 34 orbits. We sort of snuck up on the station and, you know, got the same height and uh, velocity. So now when you get on the station, what's the space station like? Oh, it's magic. I mean, first of all, I had room. You know, it was like <laughs> the size of this room. Like, if you cut this room in half, that would be a good approximation of what it's like. About 150 feet long. And uh, I loved it. I I did very well in weightlessness. I didn't get sick or anything like that. And uh, just loved it. And well, the eating, you suck out of tubes? Yeah. It's, it's either canned goods or dehydrated foods. It's kind of like backpacking. You know, you don't do it for the food. So right. now you're in there, and what what are you actually? You're taking a lot of pictures. I would be, I'd have my my t my camera going. Thousands of pictures and uh, miles of video. Now, did um, they assign you to do anything? I I had actually originally a very ambitious scientific program. I was going to grow crystals because I mentioned that that's my background. Criteria. Yeah, uh, NASA had a glove box in which I could do that. And I was going to use the Sensors Unlimited camera to image the Earth mm -hmm. because in the near-infrared, for instance, uh, water absorbs heat. So in our camera, water looks black. Ice reflects heat, so it looks white. So we can tell, for instance, uh, de-icing on a plane. If, is there melted water or is it melted ice or frozen ice? Um, so 
I wanted to bring that camera up to look at the earth to see crops. Again, wow. healthy crops look dark, uh, dry crops are white. It's long complicated because of ITAR restrictions, government restrictions. I wasn't allowed to bring the camera because oh. uh, it had to go through Russia and Kazakhstan in order to get up. And then NASA closed down the glove box about a month before uh, I went up. So I wound up doing biological experiments for the European Space Agency. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, Bo, a lot of that time was spent looking out the window saying, That's what wow. I was, well, first of all, there ain't a shot in hell that I would ever go into that little Soyuz. I can't take an elevator <laughs> and get stuck in between the floors. Uh -huh. I start getting the heebie-jeebies. So there ain't a shot in hell that Bo Dina yeah. will go up into space ever, <laughs> ever, ever. Uh -huh. So now you're there how many days? Eight days on the ISS. Wow. And then three hours coming down. So you're there and, yeah. and, 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 and nice camaraderie with oh, everybody. Oh, yeah, yep. Uh, and then and then when you, then because something happened, because yeah. I know from the story, so now you get back into the same Soyuz you came in? No, different one. Uh, that Soyuz had been up there for six months. The Soyuz has a lifetime of about six months because the fuel used on the thrusters goes bad after a while. So... There was already a Soyuz up there when I arrived. A fresh and, one. Yeah. No, 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 no. The one that had been there for six months that the last two guys used. And the first thing I did is I took my spacesuit and seat and moved it to that one because that was going to be my escape vehicle if anything went wrong. But uh, nothing went wrong, fortunately, and I came back down with astronaut John Phillips and uh, Well, cosmonaut. something happened on there. When you yeah. were coming down, on, come on. On the way down, yeah, um, we had an air leak. That just before we entered the atmosphere, we have to jettison uh, two modules. Be they burn up, and our module has a heat shield on it that protects us. But when, uh, after those things were jettisoned, one of the hatches wasn't quite closed, and I'm watching the pressure just go down and down and down. And all of a sudden, um, cosmonaut Krikalov shouts out, Olsen, Kiesler Road, which means oxygen. I throw a load? I was uh, what are you throw a Road oh, means Kiesler. oxygen. And I was the only one that could reach the emergency so if you didn't oxygen pull that valve. Fucking, oh, excuse me. If yeah. you didn't pull that thing, we would have had a, like a burnout? Uh, no, we might have been DOA. Uh, and... There's probably enough. It depends how bad the leak was, mm. you know. Uh, yeah. So you were, you were you effectively, you were the only one that could pull that thing. Yes. Wow. Uh, so I held it so open. So I could say you saved the Soyuz. I like Come to on, think Greg. of it. Uh, but, you, yeah. you saved the friggin' yeah. Soyuz. Now you're a Hit, hero in now, space. Yeah, but here's the thing, Bo. You have a space glove on, mm. and everything Russian is just tough and strong. And it took about 20 pounds pull in order to mm. hold that open. So I'm holding this thing open, and I'm watching the pressure climb up slowly, and my arm is just throbbing. Oh. And I said, Olsen, even if your arm falls off, you just can't let go. Yeah. And fortunately, I didn't. And finally, when it was up, uh, Krikalov says, OK, Olsen. <laughs> so now you enter a, a gravitational. It's a lot of heat. Do you yeah. feel oh, the heat? Oh, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it gets hot and in roll. The... No, not inside, but I can see flames on the outside. We have a window. Yeah. And what's happening is with all this debris, it's coating the window, so it's getting harder and harder to see. But uh, because of the flames, you know, you can see what's and now happening. You don't land in the water. We land in the desert of Kazakhstan. No, wait a parachute. second. You just hit the ground like boom? No, 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 no. Uh, about two miles up, we deploy a parachute. We, we slow down. Remember, all this heat that's being uh, generated is converting our speed uh, to heat energy. So we're slowing down, and when we get to about 1,000 miles an hour, we deploy the parachute, and that's how we land. And how do you hit the ground? Um, it was pretty soft. Yeah. Now, we have retro rockets. And, you know, the Soviets uh, designed them for tanks, landing tanks by parachute, because they used to break the treads when they landed. Oh, so, so they had so Yeah, uh, three feet off the ground, they fire retro rockets. And it softens it up. It softens it, but it... it it was probably an impact like 10 miles an hour. That was it. Boom. Um, yeah. It would be a lot better than when I impacted on my ankle when I jumped out of the plane Ooh. and broke my leg in half and my ankle in half. That uh, was an impact. That yeah. was a severe impact. Yeah. yeah. But wow, that that is that has to be the experience of a lifetime. Oh, after the birth of my two daughters, yeah. it is. Wow. Wow. Did you have it's any after there. effects when you came back? Yeah. Um, after you've been weightless for a period of time, you 
and you come back into wait, you feel dizzy because it plays tricks with your inner ear, mm -hmm. vestibular system. It took me about three days to get back to normal. And here's how I knew it. During those three days, all of my dreams were I was weightless, and I still remember them. They were real vivid. Wow. Where wow. I was, I was just floating around. And then the third day, it stopped, and I said, ah, oh, back is to it, normal. Now, space, uh, physicist, uh, patents, what else you do now, day to day, Greg? Oh, you know, I, I play a lot of golf. Yeah. And, and people often ask me, so what's next on your agenda? Yeah. And I, there ain't no agenda. Well, you do I mean, some stuff with the STEM with kids. Oh, I, I do you're, a lot you're of stuff. Really, you're yeah. a really benevolent guy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, any time that I've ever needed any kind of help with any kind mm -hmm. of charitable things, you're always there. Now, I'll say yeah. it to the public audience. You're, you're a remarkable guy. You, you give back tremendously. Now, what's this STEM all about? Um, science and technology education. It's just to get... Everybody, not just smart kids, educated in, in math and science. Because when we were young, it was only the the brilliant kids who went into science and Radiation engineering. Asian kids. Uh, but <laughs> it's part of everybody's life. Look, we all have cell phones. We all use computers. You've got to know a certain amount of technology. So STEM isn't just to uh, educate, you know, special kids. In my opinion, it's to educate everybody and bring their knowledge. Mm -hmm. Up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we just had a big, uh, with this new head of the uh, Chancellor of New York City Schools, I mean, he, it, to me, it's reverse racism. When you have kids that study hard, now they want to take the technology schools out of New York. They don't want specialized schools. No, uh, they I, want them to go yeah. to their school. But you want to know something. If someone wants to work harder than the other person, they I, should have that option. Whether you're black, white. There was a guy I was listening to on the radio yesterday and he came from, his mother was a, a, she cleaned houses, and the kid studied hard, and he was African-American. And he went to school, and he ended up in Harvard, and he strived, and he got mm -hmm. it. And yeah. My point is that, you know, we, we, we can't shut down, because technology, if we give the opportunity to people who have that drive to yeah. find the next cure to cancer, to find the next electrical wizardry. I mean, we have to support that I, because with that, without that, yeah. we become stagnant. I agree with you 100%. These special schools are important and they should be continued. Uh, what we're trying to do is to get more kids eligible for them, that's all. So maybe they're going to have to build additional My schools. My big thing, too, is my daughter's a school teacher, Dana, you were last time. Big thing, too, is if these children need help. I mean, some of them are mentally ill, mm -hmm. and they're not getting help. They let them go into a classroom with 30 kids, and then now they disrupt the other 29 kids. Mm -hmm. That's not a good thing either. But my thing is, we should definitely get help for those kids, and kids that can't keep up with the workload, that's what we should do, is we should help that kid along, because maybe that child will recognize, hey, I can do it too. And you'll see somebody take off then. Well, um... A movement I'm involved in is called um, uh, Trenton Literacy Movement. Yeah. It was started by Doug Palmer, former mayor of Trenton, and Carmen Catanese, Tom's father. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're taking grades kindergarten to third, and they're signing these kids up, and they say, you are going to read, and you're going to learn how to read, not just read, but read well. Because mm -hmm. they found that it. if by third grade you're under the 50% uh, in reading. Really? It's all over for you. Because think about it. What is learning? History, math, Yeah, it's if reading. you can't read, yeah. you're not learning. Absolutely. So they're all over these kids. They test them frequently. If there's any problems, whoosh, all kinds of help. And I like that. You know, like I said, you know, I feel as though as successful as I could ever become, I'd always want to give back because it's part of the, part of life to Absolutely. give back, to yeah. help people. Yeah. Helping people, I've always, that's even when I became a cop, I didn't want to be a cop, but I knew I was helping people. Mm -hmm. Helping people to me is very, very important. Well, you know what? This has been really, really an interesting uh, podcast, probably one of the most interesting ones, but we do something every week, something that's really bothering you. We call, we call it, what do we call it? The punk of the week. The punk huh. of the week. It could be an issue, a person, or a thing. And we always ask our guests, what is your punk of the week? What's bothering you today? Um, the polarization of politics. 
I mean, I'm agnostic in most things, and you know, I don't belong to any party. I always look who's the candidate and what's what's the issue, and I try and decide it on that. And the way it's like on news programs, you know, you, you, it's either a, a blue or a red news program. Yeah. It used to be the news just tried to report the facts, and that was it. It's getting harder and harder to get that. Unbelievable. So, it's all slanted. Yeah. yeah I, I want to see more bipartisanship reporting uh, and everything. Things like, to me, health care is not a political issue. They should get 100 hospital managers in, lock them in a room and say, What's the best? how do we do exactly? Right. You know? That's the one thing I never understood, Greg, yeah. is with all these minds, even with cybersecurity, yeah. with all these fabulous minds with Microsoft, Google, why can't we develop a real, using the private sector, yeah. using a all this intelligence to bring in cybersecurity that could be the best in the world? Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, I, I, I would I wish they'd uh, start maybe a separate branch of government for that, just that. It's so imperative. So, yeah. 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 It's, instead of the space, uh, air, yeah, the space yeah, force. Space force. Now, uh, Carla, what's your thing bothering you this week? Uh, it's Labor Day weekend. I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm comfortable. <laughs> Are I'm you going relaxed, to the yeah. East, uh, East Indian Day Parade in the Brooklyn where at least one or two get shot dead? I think Are you I'm going to skip that one. Um, no I'll carnival for beach. you? No. Yeah, because it was when I was a cop, it was just whenever Labor Day would come around, we knew we were going to get one or two deaths with the uh, Gombe, Mambe, and whatever they do over there. I just can't understand. When you want to have fun, why do you have to shoot guns, man? And what's really bothered me, and to, to jump on with you, I really believe also, and I, I want to say it out, and I, I, I know him for 40 years, and this president must cease and try to bring people, because in reality, he's doing a lot of good things, but the negatives pull away from the good. Hence, then, the other news media don't want to say anything about what's going on with the stock market, what's going on with the economy, what's going on with the job, because it's being fogged by all this rhetoric, yeah. and we got to slow down with the rhetoric. And one thing I plead to President Trump, learn how to say, I was wrong, and learn how to say, I'm sorry. Yeah, it I takes agree. more of a man to say you're sorry than someone who can't say that. And that's my tip of the day, which yeah. pisses me off, where he can't say, you know, I was wrong. And I'm sorry to Mexican families that work hard. You're not all rapists and criminals. You have people that work hard. And I was wrong to say that. And I want people to know that. All you got to do is say, I'm sorry or I'm wrong. Yeah. You win the election. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But that may make him lose the election if he can't come... To, mm -hmm. And let people Bring know us, he's a yeah. human being, a human being. And uh, Carlo, take it away, son. All right. Thank you very much for Greg Olson for being here. Very interesting stuff. Enjoyed learned it. Learned a lot about uh, a lot of things. Uh, you could definitely subscribe to our show. Give us a great rating. Tell your friends uh, all about it. You can follow us on social media. We're at One Tough Podcast on Twitter, and Bo is at Bo Deedle on Twitter, and at the Real Bo Deedle on Instagram. You can email us any kind of questions, comments, concerns, any guest suggestions. We appreciate our fans, and we read every message. Our email address is onetoughpodcast at gmail.com. We've got a great September lined up with some great guests, so stay tuned, and we'll see you next week. One more thing. Greg, do you do the social media? No. So no one. All right. If you want to get to Greg, you can get to Greg through uh, Carlo and Bo. Or just uh, ghoventures.com. I mean, I have a website. Okay, G-O-H. Uh, ghoventures. That's dot com. Company. You can find Greg Olson. But again, Greg is one of my dear friends. He's family. You want to get to him? Carlo could get to him at any time. Thank All you. Right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Greg.